Coming up, storm pass. There sure are a lot of hurricanes right now. How do weather people predict their path? We'll explain. Then Dr. John answers your latest questions about the coronavirus and the best defense. Also ahead, zero gravity. Our pal Al Roker shows us what it's like to experience weightlessness without being in space. And we're along for the ride. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Plus, we'll dive into the world of sharks. There are still people who would love to believe that the Megalodon exists in the depths somewhere. And inspiring kids will introduce you to this seventh grader who is on a mission to save bees. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. It's always great to be with you guys. And yes, things may look a little different around here. I'm coming to you from our new studio here at 30 Rockefeller Center in New York City. Seems like it was only yesterday I was doing the show for my apartment before the vaccines became available. Well, hope you like our new digs. We're super excited. And speaking of excitement, we've got a terrific lineup just ahead. Everything from sharks to life in space to a seventh grader who is buzzing. We'll explain that with excitement. I can't wait for you to meet this 11-year-old. But first, we start, as we often do, with the latest on the pandemic. In fact, it's the story that you'll recall inspired us to launch this program back in April of 2020. Look, we know the news headlines, especially when hearing about the coronavirus, can be scary. And we want to help you guys understand because, as I like to say, knowledge gives us power and helps us make good decisions. So here's where we are right now. Health officials are seeing an increase in the number of kids getting sick from coronavirus. But of course, for now, the COVID vaccines are only available for adults and kids 12 and older. The experts right now are still trying to make sure the shots are safe for young kids before they start giving them out. Well, we know you have a lot of questions, so let's get straight to them. Joining us now in our Ask the Doc segment is our pal, Dr. John Torres. And Dr. John, we still have a lot of questions about the coronavirus, especially with a lot of kids now being back in school, some for the first time in a long time. We've been hearing about this Delta variant, which we know is more contagious. So first off, how can kids best protect themselves against the virus? And Lester, the main thing to remember is this is what we call a layered approach, meaning you're using a lot of different things to keep yourself protected. If you can get the vaccine, meaning you're 12 or older, then get the vaccine because that can give you a lot of protection against the virus. But don't forget the three W's we used to talk about. Those are still extremely important. So wear a mask, wash your hands or sanitize them at least, and then watch your distance, three to six feet, depending where you are in school and what your school's regulations are. Those can help keep you safe, as well as making sure the adults around you hopefully are vaccinated, because that'll keep you safe too. Always good to go over those rules. Okay, now let's get to one of our viewer questions. This one comes from Chicago, and it's a question we've been hearing a lot lately. Hi. All right, Sarah, thanks. Looks like you're in the lovely Chicago waterfront. Dr. John, what about her question? And this is the big question everybody's asking right now. And we used to think this wouldn't happen until the beginning of next year. But now it looks like it's going to happen even earlier than that, especially for one age group. And what they're doing is they're dividing kids into different age groups, 5 to 11 years old. Then they're doing two years to four year olds and then six months to two year olds. And that's because they each could react differently to the vaccine. So they're testing them in all those children to make sure they get the right dosing and the right times that they need the vaccine to keep it safe and effective. It looks like now the five to 11 year olds will probably be before Thanksgiving, maybe even before Halloween. And then it'll be followed by the other groups all the way down to six months old, probably sometime after the beginning of the new year, maybe in the springtime. And you can be sure we'll be following it here on this program and, of course, on Nightly News. Dr. John Torres, exactly. thanks as always. You bet. Meantime, parts of the country are still feeling the remnants of Tropical Depression Nicholas, while some states are still trying to recover from Hurricane Ida. And we know storms can be really scary and can cause lots of flooding and other damage, of course. We just received a question from one of our regular viewers about forecasting the weather. Take a listen. Hi, it's Mary reporting from my backyard in Idaho. There sure are a lot of hurricanes right now. How do weather people predict their path? Thank you. Back to you in the studio. Bye. 
All right, Mary, thanks. That's a great question and one I wonder about a lot. And here to help us answer that is one of our own weather people around here, our pal, Dave Price. Well, thanks, Lester, and thank you, Mary. That is a terrific question. Now, let's talk about hurricanes. They're really, really strong storms that normally take place between June through November, and they produce powerful winds, lots of rainfall, and flooding, too. Now, they can be dangerous, so we take hurricanes very seriously, and we watch them carefully so we can stay out of harm's way. Now, the meteorologists at the National Hurricane Center near Miami, Florida, are in charge of forecasting these storms. They share information on wind speed and barometric pressure, how fast a storm is moving, and where it's headed to. Now, two of the most important pieces of information, how strong it is and where it's going. Now, in order to understand and predict the path that a hurricane is going to take, they use several tools. First is a satellite. Now, a satellite is a big camera, basically, orbiting in space that takes pictures or a series of pictures of the storm that shows what the storm looks like, how wide it is, how well-formed it is, or how compact it is, or all of the above. And, of course, what its current location is. The satellite literally takes a picture every few minutes for scientists to analyze. Now, the second tool that we use are airplanes, and they actually fly right into the path of the storm at different levels. And scientists on the planes drop instruments right into the storm. They take measurements, and that gives us good information about the storm's strength, pressure, speed, and future direction. Now, the third tool is the computer, the weather computer models we use. These are complex mathematical formulas that these models are based on that approximate where a hurricane may be headed. Now, there are a whole bunch of different models which scientists have come up with. Now, computer models do a good job predicting a storm's location within the first couple of days. But beyond that, it gets kind of tricky. And that's why the forecast path gets wider the farther into the future we go. So now you know a little bit more on how we forecast hurricanes. But remember, predicting the future is very difficult, especially when it comes to hurricanes. So it's always best to take care, always be safe, and pay attention to the watches, the warnings, and the meteorologists. Lester? All right, Dave Price, thanks so much for that terrific explanation and for all the work you and the team do. Well, also making headlines this week, the SpaceX mission carrying the first all-civilian crew to orbit Earth launched. The mission, dubbed Inspiration4, will conduct research designed to advance human health on Earth and during future long-duration space flights. This comes as all week across NBC News, we're taking a look up into outer space. And while the dream of being an astronaut is out of reach for most of us, one company is expanding their horizons and offering folks a chance to experience life without gravity. Our pal Al Roker has the story. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Not since Neil Armstrong's moonwalk has there been this much interest in space. Fire. Fire. Now, with civilians and billionaires like Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos taking flight, the desire to float above Earth is skyrocketing. That's incredible. <laughs> While tickets for a weightless ride like this are not yet a reality for most of us, one company, Zero G, is offering folks a gravity-defying flight of their own. Hi, Matt. Al. Hey. Their CEO, Matt Goat gave my NBC News crew and me the chance to experience zero gravity for the very first time. So I suited up, even got my own name tag. We put your name tag uh -huh. upside down since you have not flown with us before. After a quick bite to settle the stomach. I like this already, a pre-flight meal of a bagel, yes. <laughs> it was time to go through security and get a look at our rod. Our chariot awaits, look at that. A specially designed Boeing 727 Zero G calls G Force One. To outfit the plane to do what it does, how much more did it take to get it ready for this? Well, yeah, it took like nine years. This is not your ordinary Boeing jet. You now, when you have these billionaires going up, is that spurred an interest in, in your company? Oh, it definitely has because all of a sudden people say, wow, 
zero gravity, how cool, look how much fun they're having, but few people have the couple million to fly up. Matt, I'm ready to go. Let's go, let's go be weightless. Oh, I can't wait. Something I've been waiting to hear my entire life. So the G-forces are the amount of gravity that your body feels. So if you're in an airplane just traveling straight and level, that's one G, that's like standing on the ground. But if the pilot pulls back and the airplane goes up, you're gonna get more Gs, you're gonna feel heavier. On the other hand, if he pushes down and the plane goes down, you're gonna feel lighter and you're gonna feel like you're floating. Those are negative Gs or sometimes zero Gs, which means that the gravity has been canceled out. Think of it like a roller coaster. When you're at the bottom of the roller coaster and you start going up, those are positive Gs, so you feel heavier. But when you get to the top and you go over the top, you feel like you're floating a little bit. Those are negative Gs or sometimes zero Gs, which means you're not feeling any gravity. Welcome aboard G-Force One. Thank you. While G-Force One won't be taking us into space, the pilots will fly the plane in a wave formation. At the bottom, we experience 1.8 Gs of force, making us feel heavier. But as we reach the top of each arch, the plane slows down, allowing our bodies to experience zero Gs and float for over 20 precious seconds of weightlessness. Our first stop, the moon while being one-sixth my actual weight. <laughs> this is crazy. OK, let's try, let's try some one-arm push-ups okay. and see how it goes. Ready? <laughs> We're pretty strong, strength. huh? Yeah, look how strong we are. I'm strong to the finish because I eat me spinach. Now we spend some time on the moon. Now we're going to the ISS. But zero gravity is where things really take off. Whoa. Let's turn you around. <laughs> don't, 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 don't move your feet. Our flight did seven waves. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Beat down, coming out. Uh-oh. I think kryptonite is kicking in. Now it appears like it's high altitude hijinks. Look, ma, no hand. But some flights are strictly business. The all-civilian crew that will be aboard SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket later this week actually trained with Zero-G. And NASA even uses flights like these to test space equipment. Half of our flights are more and more research on things and how they will act in space and on the moon as we become more exploring of those, of those places. But give yourself a little push. I'm a little thirsty. Oh, drinks on me. <laughs> What's the craziest reaction you've seen about somebody doing this? I think the, the uniform reaction we hear a lot is this changed my life. <laughs> I got you. Mic drop. In all, we were afforded about three minutes without gravity. Oh, that is unbelievable. Before returning to the tarmac. Wow, well, we're back on the ground. <laughs> on behalf of Zero Gravity, Thank you for joining us. You are now an accomplished zero gravity flyer. Appreciate it. Our pleasure. Thank Woo. you, Alex. Oh, no. I'm my regular weight. <laughs> Thanks so much, Al. That looked like fun. And we should mention a ticket for zero G's flight starts at a pretty hefty price tag of $7,500. The company, by the way, did not charge NBC News for the flight. Well, let's turn now to the world of sharks and some interesting findings with regard to shark teeth. With that, here's our friend Kerry Sanders. Lester, every kid at five or six years old knows that their teeth are going to drop out. Guess what? Sharks are the same. Their teeth drop out constantly. And so that's a shark tooth. And I'm here in Venice, Florida, known as the shark tooth capital of the world because finding shark's teeth here is like looking for seashells, they're everywhere. But imagine finding something like this. What is this from? Let's take a look. Those huge teeth are from a shark called a megalodon, often referred to as just the meg. But unlike in the movies where a meg terrorizes swimmers, the megalodon existed about 16 million years ago, long before humans swam in the oceans or walked Earth. So while a movie with a vicious megalodon may be scary, it's what they call Hollywood fiction. It's all made up. Look at all these little teeth. Zach Fornaka hunts for evidence of megalodons almost every day. So tell me a little bit about, first of all, 
megalodon. It's it's a weird word that most of us have never heard. What what was a megalodon? The megalodon was the largest predator to ever live. It was ever 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 absolutely. It was the apex predator uh, of all time, even of dinosaurs. Correct. It was roughly the size of a school bus with rows and rows of up to six to seven inch teeth, and it was an impressive, and still is, an impressive animal to say the least. We say was. Are we sure that there are no more megalodons out there? This is ancient history? As far as we know, from all evidence, yes, the shark has been extinct for millions of years, but there are still people who would love to believe, and, and probably do believe, that the megalodon exists in the depth somewhere. But, but there's been no evidence of it, no. But there is evidence that megalodons did exist. Their teeth, in some cases 20 to 100 times larger than the size of modern day sharks. Fossils for the finding. Routinely joining Zach on the hunt for fossilized teeth, his children, five-year-old Ella and eight-year-old Kai. When they search, sometimes they uncover fossils along Florida's freshwater rivers. There it is. Other times they look for fossils on the beach, right alongside in the action, tourists. We have a scoop, my husband has a larger scoop. I have my little net, he has a bigger one. We just scoop it out, put it in and shake it and see what we can find. A treasure hidden for millions of years, just for the finding. I joined Zach offshore. Where just 15 feet down in the Gulf of Mexico, he searched the seabed with his hand, uncovering a megalodon tooth, as rewarding as scoring that winning run in a game of kickball during recess. What is that? I found the tooth to a megalodon shark. Just out here in the Gulf of Mexico. Just out here in the Gulf of Mexico. Waiting for you to find it. It's waiting millions of years. <laughs> You've got the teeth. Why don't you have the rest of the body fossilized out there? Well, so most sharks, uh, their bodies are made of primarily of cartilage, so cartilage just doesn't survive through time. The teeth with the enamel and the bone root survive beautifully. And depending on the minerals in the water or in the ground, you know, you get different colors. So it's, it's really the teeth are the one thing you can count on that will stand the test of time. Hunting for fossils. As the collection Zach and his kids have gathered proves, there's so much to find. And don't worry guys, these teeth are indeed fossils. It's not like you're gonna be swimming out there and come across a megalodon, they are extinct. But if you're fortunate enough to find one of these, it will take some patience, some good luck, and some good fortune. And it turns out these teeth can be worth a fortune. Zach sold one to a collector for $50,000. Lester? All right, Kerry, thanks so much for that. Finally, in our inspiring kids series, a seventh grader from Illinois has launched a campaign she really believes in. Our friend Kristen Dahlgren has details. Don't forget to get outside and enjoy nature today. Just outside of Chicago, Illinois, seventh grader Scarlett Harper is buzzing with excitement. The 11-year-old is leading a mission to save the bees. Bees had always been one of my favorite parts of my yard, and I love watching them. And they're so cool and so important to humans because they pollinate a third of our food supply. And so seeing few of them was really alarming. People who decide to spray these chemicals in their yard don't realize that what they're doing is killing pollinators and wildlife. Scarlett did her homework. She learned that certain sprays used on plants to prevent mosquitoes are actually deadly for bees. And since bees are vital to our ecosystem, Scarlett decided to step in. And I kind of wondered how I could try to regulate these pesticides and make sure they were used less and more safely and try to help keep them from harming bees. We decided that there was an opportunity to put together a piece of legislation. The young leader reached out to State Representative Robin Gable and together they've created the Bee Bill. Over the last few months, the bill has gained 22 co-sponsors and lots of momentum so far. I wanted to work on the issue of bees because I love bees and I think that they're really, really important. And they're just like, they're really sweet creatures. And if you're not afraid of them, they're not afraid of you. And here are some other facts you may not believe. Bees travel up to five miles out of their hive to find food. 
and they always make their way back home at night. Plus, a single bee makes only a quarter teaspoon of honey in her life. Bees are very intelligent. It's fun facts like these that inspired Scarlett. Her passion for this cause also stems from her love of gardening. And you get this super nutrient rich soil. And her time spent outdoors. And while she has a big goal underway, she says the message behind it all is really simple. Get started today, do what you can, do something and like find other people who also care about your issues and work together because now is the very best time to do something. Kristen, thank you so much. And Scarlett, keep up the great work. Well, that's going to do it for us. Parents, always this reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com, and we'll try to get it answered in an upcoming program. And you can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. Thanks for watching, and remember to take care of yourself and each other. So long.